Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Wherever you're at in your life right now, if you're hurting so bad, you feel like your guts are going to fall out and you feel like you cannot stand it. Don't sit there tonight and say, don't tell me I need to just put up with this. I didn't come here to hear you tell me I need to put up with this and put a smile on my face. I want you to give me the three magic steps to get rid of it in 24 hours. <laughs> Amen. I came here tonight to get a word, sister. Well, you are getting a word right now. Dig in both heels and say, I am never going to quit and I am never going to give up. Quitting is not an option. You may feel like giving up, but we're not going to let you. We're going to tell you tonight, you got to get up. Instead of giving up, you're going to get up and press into the new beginning that God has for you and live the life that God wants you to live. We're going to talk about what happens from the pit to the palace. Joseph was a young man who had a dream, and I hope and pray that you have a dream for your life. Not having any kind of goals or any kind of dreams for your life is kind of a boring, dull way to live. Don't ever stop dreaming. No matter how old you are, don't stop dreaming. You're not too young to dream. You're not too old to dream. And even if you've got some shattered dreams in your life, I want to encourage you to dream again. We are created, we're goal-oriented people. We, we need to look forward to something. We need to have something that we're working toward. And so, being a person who has a dream and being goal-oriented is a very important thing. Joseph was a man with a dream. He was a young boy who had a dream. And he was young, he was inexperienced, he was immature, and he had a lot to learn, but he had a dream that God gave him. And he saw himself in a role of leadership. He actually saw his brothers and his father bowing down to him, and he went and told them, which wasn't a very smart thing to do. <laughs> Sometimes you need to keep a little bit of what you're seeing for your future to yourself and just let God make it happen because naturally that didn't go over too big with them. Well, his brothers, being very jealous of him and actually hating him, decided that they were going to get rid of him. So let's look at Genesis chapter 37 beginning in verse 18. And when they saw him far off, even before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. And they said one to another, see, here comes this dreamer and the master of dreams. You know, sometimes, especially if you're around negative people who don't want to do anything with their life, they're going to get mad at you if you have a dream for your life. Amen. So come on now, let us kill him and throw his body into some pit. <laughs> you know, the devil's always trying to dig some kind of a pit for us and trying to pitch us in it, whether it's a pit of depression, a pit of discouragement, a pit of poverty, a pit of sickness and disease. He always wants us to be somewhere between, before, besides on top where God wants us to be. So now let us kill him and throw him into some pit. Then we'll go and tell lies to our father. Well, we see him in the pit, but now let's look at Genesis 41, beginning in verse 38. And we see a whole different situation with him. Now we see him in the palace. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find this man's equal? a man in whom is the Spirit of God. Now, a lot of years have gone between this pit thing and what we're seeing now. And in a minute, we're going we're gonna to spend the rest of the evening talking about what to do in the middle. Because <laughs> a lot of times we only tell about have a dream, and then we kind of talk about how great it's going to be when your dream comes to pass, but we got to talk about the middle. Because a lot of people never make it through the middle. So I'm going to just get real practical with you tonight and tell you how to get from the pit to the palace. Don't just have a dream to get out of the pit and get to the palace, but know what you need to do when you're in the middle 
and even understand what's going on in your life when you're in the middle. How many of you feel like right now you're in the middle? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, for as much as your God has shown you all of this, there is nobody as intelligent and discreet and understanding and wise as you are. Look at the favor that God has given this young man now. And you shall have charge over my house, and all my people shall be governed according to your word with reverence, submission, and obedience. Only in matters of the throne will I be greater than you are. Then Pharaoh said, Joseph, said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in official vestments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Well, 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 his dream came true. Why is it that sometimes people's dreams don't come true? Because they're not willing to do what Joseph did on his way from the pit to the palace. It's kind of hard, you know, when you're having to wait longer than you thought you would, and things are a lot harder than you thought they would be, and it seems to be costing you more in your life than what you ever think that you can bear, and it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. But the people who refuse to quit, the people who won't give up, I can tell you, I promise you, if you won't quit and you won't give up, you will make it to the finish line. You will make it to the finish line. Well, Satan has dug a pit for most of us. He certainly dug one for me, and I'm sure he's dug one for you. I'm sure if you watch my program and you've heard much of my teaching, you know about my testimony, and I won't labor over it tonight here for very long, but just in case you don't know, I was sexually abused by my father and abandoned into that situation by my mother who knew what my dad was doing but didn't have the courage to do anything about it. And uh, anytime that you're treated like that, and many of you know exactly what I'm talking about, you've been mistreated in your life, it's just tough when you get started all messed up. You know, you don't, you don't have the right love, you, you feel rejected, you just get all kinds of weird ideas and, and your, your, your feelings are all messed up. And so then it can take years and years and years to recover from that. And that's even if you know how to recover or even believe that you can recover. I spent a lot of years not even knowing that I could get out of that pit and someday really have a great life. I believe the lies of Satan, but I just want to encourage you here tonight that God is no respecter of persons, and what he does for one, he will do for anybody. The promises of God are for whosoever will. And if you ever see one person who has come up out of the pit and made it to a place of having a good life, we'll call it the palace for lack of better terms. If you know anybody that was ever in the pit and now they're in the palace, you can be there too. I said, you can be there too. You can be there too. But now listen. You get a testimony by passing the test. <laughs> I only have a testimony because I went through a lot of hard things and I passed the test. A lot of people have a test and all they end up with is the monies. They never have the testimony, they just have the monies. They moan and groan about everything that's going on in their life. Now, if you know very much about the story of Joseph and Many of you do and many of you don't. You know, I've, I have found out just even in the last few months that it is amazing how many people who come to these conferences that really don't know the word at all. You're hungry people and you, you, you've seen a spark of something, maybe watching the TV program or maybe somebody's been sharing with you and, you know, there's just a little flicker of hope that maybe things can change for you, but you don't know the word of God. Recently, I asked in a conference how many people were not familiar with Isaiah 61, which talks about how God will give us beauty for ashes, and there was maybe 70% of the people that put their hand up. And so I'm not going to talk to you tonight like I think you know everything. I'm going to talk to you like I don't think you know anything, and don't let that be insulting to you, because even if you do know a lot, there's a lot of people in here, and certainly a lot of people watching by television, that don't know much of anything. And I want to tell you that if you're in a pit right now in your life that Jesus is an expert at getting people out of pits. He's the one who said if there is one sheep in a pit, 
that he will leave the 90 and 9 and he will go and get out the one that is in the pit. And I tell you, if you are the only one that's in a pit, Jesus wants to come and get you out of your pit. Amen. And I want you to know that you need to have a dream for your life. And maybe you've never heard that. that. That's old stuff to some of us that have been around a long time. But you can have a dream for your life. You don't have to stay where you're at. You can make progress and you can end up having an absolutely wonderful life. But there will be things that you will need to go through. And there will be times where you will need to be faithful and determined and diligent. And you'll have to endure and not quit and give up. As we said last night, victory with God is not a ride on an escalator. It is a walk of faith one step at a time. And we don't understand everything, but I can tell you this. Now listen to this because this is important for tonight. Whatever you go through, if you put your trust in God, He will use it for your good and work it out to your benefit. That is one thing that is so amazing about God is he doesn't do bad stuff, but when we trust him, he takes bad stuff and he actually makes it good stuff in our life. Who can take bad stuff and make it good stuff? Only God. I don't know how to explain this to you, but I don't even say anymore, I'm sorry, I wish that I wouldn't have been abused. I don't even say that anymore. I have to tell you, and it, it doesn't even make any sense to my mind, but I'm not even sorry that it happened. Because I know that some way, somehow, God has worked that into my life, and it has helped me be the person that I am today, and I believe it's helped me to be able to help you. And I say this often, I want you to get this tonight. Right now, what you think is your worst enemy, someday you may realize was your best friend. Because we don't grow in the good times in our life. We grow spiritually when we need to hang on to God, and that's all we've got to hang on, and we're hanging on for all that we've got. Joseph went through some very difficult times. He was gotten out of that pit, and I'm sure he was glad about that, but then the next thing that happened was he was sold as a slave. So then he was a slave in Potiphar's house for a long time. And then he got in with somebody else and got favor with him. And then Potiphar's wife wanted to have sex with him. And he held on to his integrity and said, no, I won't. She lied about him and ended up, he ended up getting put in prison for 13 years for something that he didn't do. But even in prison, he ended up being in charge. You know, when you really are a man or a woman of God, Truthfully, no matter where you're at, God can exalt you and lift you up. No matter where you're at. I mean, every place where he was at, he got put in charge of something, and people recognized that God's hand was upon him and God's favor was upon him. There's no real written record of what Joseph's attitude was and what his thoughts were and how he behaved himself during those times, but it's very evident in Scripture that he was a very positive guy that kept a great outlook. At the end of the whole thing, when his brothers did come and have to bow down before him because he was in charge of all the food that was left in the land and they were starving and needed food, sure enough, just like his dream, they bowed down before him and they were very repentant. And he said to them, it's recorded in Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil and harm, God intended for good. What you meant for harm, God intended for good, that I might be in a position to feed many people in this day and hour. And you know, I don't know. If I wouldn't have gone through what I went through, I don't know. Would I be standing here tonight? I, I'm not sure. It helped make me what I am. Now, you know, God doesn't do bad things, but if you trust God, wherever you're at in your life right now, Wherever you're at in your life right now, if you're hurting so bad, you feel like your guts are going to fall out and you feel like you cannot stand it. Don't sit there tonight and say, don't tell me I need to just put up with this. I didn't come here to hear you tell me I need to put up with this and put a smile on my face. I want you to give me the three magic steps to get rid of it in 24 hours. <laughs> Amen. I came here tonight to get a word, sister. Well, you are getting a word right now. Dig in both heels and say, I am never going to quit and I am never going to give up. 
Devil, you just go wear yourself out bothering somebody else because I am going to get from the pit to the palace and you are not going to stop me. It's amazing what will happen if you have enough determination. It's time to come up out of the pit. Let's look at Zechariah 9, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, as for you also, because of and for the sake of the covenant of the Lord with his people, which was sealed with sprinkled covenant blood, I have released and sent forth your imprisoned people out of the waterless pit. Thank God, because of the blood of Christ, we have been released. No pit can hold you because of what Christ did for you. Do you hear me? No pit can hold you. And I love, 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 love verse 12. Return to the stronghold of security and prosperity, you prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will restore double your former prosperity to you. Now, what's he saying? If you will be a prisoner of hope, just imagine, and I did this one time, I had a jail cell built for the platform. I got in it, and it had a title on it, Hope. And I said, if you will be a prisoner of hope, in other words, you just can't get away from hope. You're not going to give up hope. You're locked up with hope. You're in prison with hope. You know, it is impossible to defeat somebody who won't stop hoping that they're going to see change in their life. Now, some of you came in sad, but you're going to go out glad. Some of you maybe even came in mad, and you're going to go out glad. And you're going to have an attitude of confidence and trust that God can take every bad thing that happened to you and he can work it out for good and God will not only give you back what you lost, but he will give you double what you lost. I call it getting double for your trouble. Amen. You know, the, the devil is always trying to throw us in pits because frankly he knows that he's going to be the one that's going to end up in the pit. Not going to take time to go there, but in Revelation 20, the first three verses, it gives a pretty clear description of him being bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So he's the one that's on the way to the pit, and that's why he's throwing such a fit, trying to keep us in one. You throw a fit on the way to the pit. Amen. <laughs> now, when you're on the way from the pit to the palace, and I, I want you to settle in with me and get this tonight because, man, I want you to have victory. I don't want you to quit somewhere in the middle. Don't be the kind of person who's always getting started towards some kind of victory, and when it gets a little tough, you run back to the starting line, quit and give up, and then start all over again. These times from the pit to the palace are testing times. They test our character. They develop us into the men and women of God that he needs us to be in order for us to represent him in the earth. You know, when I was in 1976, God touched my life and I received a real word from God that I was going to preach the gospel all around the world, which to be honest with you was totally, completely ridiculous and impossible beyond impossible. It just... There was just no way unless it was God that it was ever going to happen. And I thought, like most people do when they hear from God, that surely I would just roll out of bed the next morning and have this big ministry. Well, you know, it didn't happen like that. I had lots of what I call silent years, years where it was just me and God and my dream that most of the time the devil was telling me I was crazy. And I would get little opportunities. I taught a home Bible study for five years, and then I added a second one somewhere along in there. And then God put me on a shelf, and I did nothing for a year, and boy, that was hard. And, you know, then I worked at a church and came under somebody else's authority for five years, and then I felt like God wanted us to go out, take the ministry north, south, east, and west. And so, you know, then I didn't, wasn't getting a paycheck from a church. I was having to believe God for my paycheck. And, I mean, I did so many little teeny tiny meetings in places that nobody would want to be in. I mean, it's nice to be here tonight in the arena that's full of beautiful people. This is, I mean, this is the palace, folks. But I tell you, on my way from the pit to the palace, I had to do a lot of things and be a lot of places where you wouldn't have been too, too excited to have been. 
I remember more than one time going into these little banquet centers and having to clean the chicken legs off the floor from the party the night before, before we could set up chairs and have a meeting there. I mean, we used to be just like uh, me, Dave, and this one guy that was the worship leader. We were it. I mean, Dave drove the truck. He got all the resources in. He set them all up. I did the preaching. I did the praying. I did the ministering. And the worship guy could sing, play guitar, play a piano, and he played a drum machine with one foot, and he was the band. <laughs> Amen. And I did that for years and years and years and years. Well, hey, it's great. Tonight we've got Matt Redman, I mean, one of the greatest worship leaders and songwriters in the world. Uh, here in a few weeks, we're going to have Israel Houghton with us. And I mean, last week we had Martin Smith and we had all, all kinds of people. We had Jesus culture from out in California. And so, you know, now we can get the best of the best. But let me tell you something. I had the guy that could do everything with his foot and the rest with his hands for a lot of years. A lot of years. And I got so tired of it. I want you to listen to me. I got so tired of it. When you have a big vision, you're not excited about little. Come on. And maybe you've got a big vision for your life, whether it's to get out of debt or get married or see your kids change or get your house cleaned up or get, you know, well, whatever. It doesn't have to be to preach. But I hope and pray to God that you've got some kind of vision for something better than what you've got right now. And you know, what God does is while you're on your way to seeing the fulfillment of your dreams, He will give you little tiny glimpses along the way. that there's still a little spark of hope. <laughs> and that's enough for us crazy people to just hold on and believe the impossible and believe that the Word of God is really true and that it really can happen for us. You can't quit and you can't give up. You've got to pass your tests. And I want to tell you something about God. With Him, you never flunk. You just get to keep doing takeovers, do-overs, <laughs> until you pass. So it's up to you if you want to take the same test 200 times. Come on, is anybody getting this? You can take the same test 200 times, but let me tell you something. If you find yourself right now going around and around the same stupid mountain over and over and over and over, why don't you wake up and say, uh, duh, this is not working. <laughs> Maybe I need to just yield and do what God wants me to. Anybody ready to do that? Just yield and do what God wants you to? Because you know what? God's not going to change His mind. I don't know if you've heard the story, maybe you have, about the donkey that fell in the pit. And uh, his owner looked down in there and said, you know, that's an old donkey and that pit's deep and it would really be a lot of work to try to get him out of there. And since he's old anyway, I think I'll just call some of my friends over and some of my neighbors, and we're just going to bury him with dirt and just leave him in that pit. So he brought some friends around, and they were shoveling dirt on this poor donkey. And at first, he was just crying piteously. I don't know how a donkey sounds, but you know, <laughs> really bad, really loud. Just sounded really bad. Just, just sounded terrible. And af after just a few shovels, the donkey got real quiet, and they thought, well, maybe he's already dead. They didn't know. And, but they didn't realize what was happening. Every shovel full of dirt that would hit his back, he would shake it off and get on top of it. Come on now. They'd throw more dirt in, he'd shake it off and get up on top of it. And he did that long enough, refusing to give up, and pretty soon there was enough dirt in that pit that it lifted him all the way to the top and he just walked out. Now, I don't know what you're going to do in your pit with the dirt that's being thrown on you, but I decided to start standing on top of it and get out and head for the palace, and I want you to do the same thing. Glory to God. Well, at times we all feel discouraged or perhaps we feel like giving up, but if that's you today, I want you to know that God is faithful in every situation 
In fact, according to Romans 8.28, God can use whatever you're going through and bring it around for good. So one thing that God needs you to do, though, is make up your mind that you are never going to give up. I've often said that I believe that was one of my greatest strengths. There were many things I didn't understand and many things that hurt so bad I just felt like I couldn't stand it. But I was determined that I was never going to give up. Well, here at the ministry, we strive to help people both here in the U.S. and around the world. We do that by providing help such as the gospel, medical care, clean water, feeding programs. It's like being part of one big family, and today I'm inviting you to join the family. If you're not a partner with Joyce Meyer Ministries, we would so appreciate your commitment to become one. We don't ask for or require any certain amount of money. All that we ask you to do is pray and then do what you believe that God has asked you to do and to do it consistently. It's the consistency that is really important to us because we're consistently on television daily around the world and so we need consistent partners that are going to stick with us. And not only will you be helping preach the gospel through television, but all these many, many thousands upon thousands of outreaches, people being fed and clean water being provided and medical care and putting books into prisons and all the things that Jesus tells us not to forget to do. And so I believe that you will pray and that if God puts it on your heart to join the family, I believe that you will. So thank you for your consideration. God bless you.